Ladies and gentlemen, else does. Um, so in the U.S. mortality statistics, the only cancers that seem to be rising in mortality are cervical cancer and endometrial cancer in the past five or six years. Do you know why that is? I don't think we know why that is. It's, yeah. it, there's no, like, late presentation or lack no. of that? No. Um, I mean, one thing would be um, looking at obesity. I mean, obesity is on the rise for endometrial cancer, but um, looking at that, even controlling for that, I do believe that it's still on the rise. Right. So. Then I'm curious about HPV vaccination. So obviously HPV vaccination in Nepal or India would eliminate most of the cases they see there of cervical cancer, head and neck cancer. Are there any public health efforts that are going to be doing that or coordinating that? Um, so that's, that's a big thing that people are working on. The uptake in the U.S. has been disappointing. It's getting better than what it was, but it has been disappointing. Um, and I actually just recently saw a, a paper circulated suggesting that in the U.S. as well that most cervical cancers could be prevented if we had uh -huh. um, adequate uptake of the HPV vaccine. As it pertains to HPV-mediated head and neck cancer, that's still primarily an issue of the, United, the U.S., um, oftentimes when uh, international trials are being presented, you'll have American colleagues get up and say, what's the HPV data? Uh -huh. And there'll be a giggle that says it's not due to HPV, it's due to tobacco and alcohol. Okay. So it's still more so predominantly a, a problem in the U.S. Having said that, um, I do think that vaccination efforts for both boys and girls are improving, um, and many folks are realizing that these vaccines are not just critical for our girls, but also for boys, especially since um, it's still a three to one male to female ratio for HPV mediated cancers. Um, more men are getting it than women, even when controlled for sexual partners. Uh, and HPV mediated oropharynx cancer is gonna be felt to, to um, uh, emerge as the number one leading cause of HPV mediated cancers um, surpassing cervical cancer. So it is definitely important that vaccinations are occurring. The um, age range for uh, the HPV vaccination recently changed. So it's nine to 45, I believe, for both men and women. Yeah, I saw a TV ad this morning about a mother and a young boy who was gonna get vaccinated between 11 and 13. Um, sponsored by Merck here, but um, it's not sort of coordinated and happening in third world countries by the World Health Organization or any sort of public health effort to mass vaccinate people for HPV. I mean, we see a lot of advanced cervical cancers on the tumor boards when I call in with Dr. Shaw. Um, it seems sort of a tragedy. <laughs> yeah. Is there, um, for HPV related head and neck cancers, is there a lot of de escalation going on with the radiation dose and schedule? So with respect to clinical trials, absolutely. Um, there are trials <coughs> looking at can we eliminate the radiosensitizer, can we swap it out for a cytotoxic versus uh, an immunotherapy agent. There's also trials looking at uh, can we change perhaps the dose of the radiation or the extent of the field of radiation. So there are numerous trials going on at present to try, and some of them have already accrued, we're just waiting on results to report out. So there's a number of trials that are that are ongoing or in process uh, of resulting, but certainly what concerns me more is that there's de-intensification occurring outside of clinical trials, and right. not just in the community, I'm seeing this in academics as well. Um, right. I really think that we should not be de-intensifying therapy because we don't have very good biomarkers other than if you don't have a big tumor and you didn't smoke a lot, you're more likely to do better. Um, but outside of that, we really don't know who's going to be the bad actor. Um, and we're jeopardizing survival outcomes in patients who really are more likely to survive if we treat them appropriately. The issue is the toxicity, and that's an issue for across the board. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we should not be de-intensifying outside of a trial. What, what sort of screening do you do at uh, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance for BRCA women, BRCA positive women for ovarian cancer? So 
um, everybody's doing something different now, but now that we have the Solo One data, it's become imperative that they're not just getting diagnosed, you know, or screened, you know, after they finish their chemotherapy or in the recurrent setting. And so um, all of our women actually are getting um, combined germline testing as well as somatic testing for a panel of genes. Um, it's called BROCA, and it's at our institution at the University of Washington. Um, because we also don't want to be missing those um, somatic mutations either, right. and also that these things, you know, um, people having a RAD51D mutation or BRIP1 mutation, those all can um, predict response to PARP inhibitors. So we're doing comprehensive testing right from the get-go. Um, at their, um, at their post-operative visit, we try to coordinate that they see a genetic counselor at the same time, and the genetic counselor then um, can help navigate insurance and make sure that it will cover this strategy. And how are you screening women with BRCA mutations who don't have ovarian cancer yet? What, what do you do in that setting? relatives of these patients? Or yeah, so, um, well, anyone with ovarian cancer, are you talking about like if I see a patient with ovarian cancer about their family, or you mean a, family. Uh, someone with a, a Someone who doesn't history. have ovarian cancer yet, who has a BRCA mutation, is there a screening? Oh, program? yeah, so, um, well, screening is pretty controversial. Um, yeah. We have failed to demonstrate a survival benefit in the high, even in the high-risk population, and so I always talk about that with women to say, you know, it's something that we offer, but it really is not meant to replace risk-reducing surgery. Um, so women with a BRCA1 mutation, we offer risk-reducing BSO between the age of 35 and 40. Um, for women with a BRCA2 mutation, because they tend to get their cancers a little bit later, we offer it between the ages of 40 to 45. And we try to, um, in the interim, we will offer screening. Usually for BRCA1 patients, we'll offer CA125 and ultrasound um, starting at age 30. We don't want to start too young because you're going to fix, you know, find false positives when they're not quite at the age of risk, and that has its harms too, we know. Um, and then, so generally five years before we recommend risk-reducing RSO, but we are really trying to make sure women understand the flaws of the screening, that it can pick up false positives and also false negatives, and that we're not, when we pick up a cancer um, through screening, it's rare that we're finding it in a stage one compared to stage three, you know, that we're actually not finding that survival benefit. So, um, mm -hmm. so we don't want women to get false reassurance by doing screening. Okay. And in lung cancer, we see more uh, PD-1 expression in smokers than non-smokers. Is that the case in head and neck cancer, or the HPV-related ones also have high PD-1 expressions? There's no correlation between smoking and in response to the pdl one inhibitors? I'm not certain that there is a correlation. Yeah. Anybody out there have questions for the experts? All right. Thank you very much for speaking.